Damon Wayne. This is really old and it looks kind of funny. The taste, the taste, the taste is in the shape. The taste is in the shape of honey. Cake. We all love the taste. The crunch is in the shape. Pop and funky honey. The crunch is really great. The crunch is on the money. The taste, the taste, the taste is in the shape. The taste is in the shape of honey. Cake. We all love the taste. The taste. Part of it's the complete taste. breakfast. The taste is in the shape. Man, your battle station. Man, your battle station. It's electronic talking battleship from Milton Bradley. So real, it really talks. Battleship armed. Battleship armed. We're talking instant programming, free skill levels, and only Milton Bradley's got them. Carrier hit. Carrier hit. Against the computer or opponent, your mission, sink the enemy's fleet. Battleship sunk. Battleship sunk. Yeah, now you're talking. Electronic talking battleship and original battleship, only from Milton Bradley. Nickelodeon had the original plan To give you what you want was the way it began Super Toy Run A Super Toy Run What is a dream for every kid in the land? Nick found out and put it right in your hand A Super Toy Run A Super Toy Run So keep watching Nick cause what you want is our aim And keep dreaming dreams and we'll do the same A Super Toy Run A Super Toy Run Doctors agree that stomach trouble is both universal and profitable, but... Oh, Uncle, what are those little A's and B's? The A stands for apple. And the B? Stands for banana. I ate one on St. Swithin's Day. When? St. Swithin's Day, 1943. Wow! Yes, Bullwinkle has the rather unique ability to remember everything he eats. The trouble is that Bullwinkle ate a banana on which Boris Badenov had written a secret formula. I will get formula back even if it kills most. Oh, I am so happy you see things my way, darling. Let's go. Boris, wait on the corner. Wait on the corner for what? He's a policeman. How do we get past him? Fui! Who's scared of policemen? And folding his switchblade knife and putting it in his hat, the smug Boris walked right up to the policeman and said, Officer, would you hold my hand across the street? Certainly, little fella. See, that's quite a mustache you got there. My mommy drew it for me, didn't you, mommy? That's right, darling. Well, give me your hand, little lad. Take my hand, I'm a stranger in Steubenville. And the unsuspecting policeman led Boris and Natasha right across the street. There you are, me bucko. And the kindly policeman patted Boris on the head. Unfortunately for the villain, his switchblade knife had a hair trigger and... <laughs> Say to that, Agnes McGee, what's that? It's a fingernail file. A 12-inch nail file? I got 12-inch fingernails. Come along with me, you're under arrest. As a spy? No. As a crook? No. As a killer? No. What then? As a juvenile delinquent. And so Boris Badenov's scourge of civilization was taken to juvenile hall, given a hot bath, dressed in sleepers, and tucked in for the night. Next day he appeared in court, was lectured by the judge, and his switchblade taken away. Then he was released in Natasha's custody. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Oh, Natasha, the disgrace. Me, world's greatest villain a juvenile delinquent, what will fearless leader say? Well, cheer up, Sonny, you. Don't call me Sonny. Boris Badenov, calling Boris Badenov. There he is now. Fearless leader, hello, fearless leader, old body boy. You got secret formula yet, Badenov? Not yet, but any minute now, you know me. That's why I keep checking up. Well, your time is running out. Goodbye, Sonny. Oh, boy. Well, of course, now Boris knew he had to get Bullwinkle off to some deserted spot where the police wouldn't see him. Okay, here is what we do. Boga, roga, boga, doga, boga, roga, boga, boga. I can't understand the word you say, Boris. Speak up! Oof. I said, boga, roga, poga, doga, boga, roga, boga, doga. That's what I thought you said. 
You think I'm gonna let every Tom, Dick, and Gordon in on the plot? Apparently not, for just a short time later, a familiar-looking figure pedaled a bicycle up to our heroes and said, Telegram for Moose, telegram for Bullwinkle. Here, boys. Sign here. Okay. You're supposed to sign name. That's an X. It's my middle initial. Oh. And here's a nickel for your trouble. Nickel? Couldn't you make it a dime? I got two wives and baby goldfish to support. Make it seven cents. Okay, I give up one wife. Cheap skates. What does the telegram say, Bullwinkle? Oh, boy, get a load of this. Congratulations, you have been chosen to spend a free weekend at Lake Kitchy Itchy Lodge. Signed the management. Isn't that nice? Well, no. For if Bullwinkle had only known anybody who spent a weekend at Lake Kitchy Itchy Lodge stayed there permanently. But we'll find out more in our next episode, Two Days to Doom or The Last Weekend. <laughs> Back in the days when everyone was on the Snow White kick, scallywags and roustabouts had an easy time of it. Your money or your life? Oh, that's easy. You can take my wife. Not your wife, your life. It's funny you're my way, but take my purse. Statistics showed that crime was rampant, especially in a tiny kingdom known as Easy Pickens. The people there used to set their watches by the number of robberies that occurred. What time do you have? Now, let me see. The blacksmith is being held up, so it must be 11.15. This might have gone on indefinitely had it not been for the arrival of a jolly gentleman on a black donkey whose name was Mule. Oh, Mule! His name was Skylar Sugg, and his hobby was preventing crime. Your money or your wife? Lady appeared as if by magic, and the robber was thwarted. What's more, Mr. Sugg spent the next seven days in wielding his shillelagh in the cause of justice. Citizens of Easy Pickens, we owe a great deal to Skylar Sugg. It comes to $43.12. He has not only cleaned out the town, but he's cleaned out the town twisty. Sugg opened a tiny but adequate detective agency and proceeded to solve any and all mysteries. I lost my pet cow, Mr. Sugg. You'll find him inside the counter at the butcher's store at 89 cents a pound. He's on special, too. Somebody's been stealing eggs from our chicken house, Mr. Sugg. Oh, sorry, I didn't see you eating your breakfast. Be with you as soon as I finish these coddled eggs. And there's no doubt of it, fellow villagers. Skylar Sugg is our man of the year. Yay! I don't know what to say, Mr. Mayor. Yay! That's when the trouble started. It was one of the coldest winters on record. And a massive fog bank sprang up out of the lower valleys and blanketed the area. It didn't stay very long, but it left behind something. For there, in the middle of a once vacant meadow, stood a black castle. Must be one of those prefab jobs. It was then he noticed that not a door or a window was to be seen. You in there! Lower the drawbridge! No answer. Just the cold, clammy wind whistling through the turrets. Better send a wire to Alfred Hitchcock. The news spread through the town like wildfire, and by noon, everyone was standing before the huge castle. It's black magic, that's what it is. Nonsense, Mr. Mayor. Here, boys, take these torches and set fire to the place. But suppose there's a witch in there. We'll smoke her out. Under Sugg's direction, the villagers set the castle on fire. Or at least they tried to. The castle won't burn, Mr. Sugg. What do you mean it won't burn? You can smell the smoke. But the smoke was coming from a nearby forest. Why, it's supernatural, that's what it is. We set the castle on fire and the forest burns up. Poppycock and Balderdash and all those other reindeer. The others were too frightened to move. Not Skylar Sugg, though. He carried a huge sack of gunpowder to the edge of the moat, lit a fuse, and then swung the sack around and around and finally flung it high over the castle wall. Watch. Any second now. Boom! They watched in breathless silence, waiting for the blast. And they got what they were waiting for. Unfortunately, it wasn't the castle that blew up. It was half the village. Sugg was in for a fight. Why? 
We better keep an eye on this castle. You'd better get some sleep, Skyler. You've got an awful lot of work to do tomorrow. I have got an awful lot of work to do right now. Extracting a magnifying glass from his pocket, Skyler left the warm fire to probe the back side of the castle. I'll take over while you're sleuthing. Nothing happened for about 10 or 15 minutes. Then, suddenly, the drawbridge of the castle slowly came down. What'll we do, Mr. Mayor? Only one thing to do. We've got to go inside. Brave words indeed. Thus the mayor, in fact, the remainder of the village, went slowly across the drawbridge and into the black castle. No sooner did they enter than the drawbridge mysteriously went up, sealing one and all inside. Dawn was late in coming, and so was Skylar Sugg, who had gotten lost in the pitch darkness and spent most of the night home in bed. Good morning, every... Uh, a chill ran through him. There was no one left. They were such wonderful folks. They were always trying to do something for me. His hair, what was left of it, stood on end, as once more the drawbridge came down. Would he be able to summon enough courage to go in alone and uncover the secret? Heavens no! I am not going in there! Oh, go on, Mr. Sugg. We'll be right behind you. Go ahead now. Open the door. <sighs> surprise! <laughs> surprise! <laughs> Happy birthday, Skyler! Them's my kind of people. Concern them! Shampoo! I'm shampooing it. Kids. Wow! They love taking baths, and you can even wash their hair. <laughs> Taking a bath in my Splash and Tan Kids. Cabbage Patch Splash and Tan Kids. Each purchase separately. Nobody challenges the king of the schoolyard. Nobody but Mikey. Okay, King, you and me, one on one. It's Super <laughs> Slam Basket. High speed reload and realistic <laughs> sound. Warming from the paint. <laughs> I'll pop from the cherry <laughs> stripe. Three-point range. The scoreboard tells the tale. Nothing but net. Super Slam Basket and Full Court Slam Basket from Catacomb. What does it feel like to play, Simon? You gotta look. Sounds and colors. Think fast! What does it feel like to play Simon? Intense. Simon from Milton Bradley. A challenge intensified to the max. That you down there, Junior? Sure is, Pop. I'm digging for gold. In your mother's gardenia patch? Well, according to my treasure chart, there's gold down here. Let me see that. Hmm, my favorite gold mines by Marilyn Monroe. Where'd you get this? I bought it off a rag peddler. For how much? Six cents. Uh-huh. That, my boy, is a classic example of a fool and his money are soon parted. It wasn't my six cents, Pop. I took it off your dresser. Yeah, that's beside the point. You were still swindled. Now stop digging and listen to this fable. I call it the fox and the rabbit. Years ago, when vaudeville was in its heyday, a certain fox named Foxini the Great toured the hinterlands as a magician. For my next trick, I shall need a volunteer. How do you do, sir? May I borrow your pocket watch? Thank you. Now, I drop the watch, made in Switzerland, into this hat. Stir it with an egg beater. Tap it gently with a sledgehammer, and then pour a vial of acid over it. I then cover the hat with a Hindu cloth, and say the magic words, Helen Twelve Tree, and Ricardo Cortez, and presto. Go ahead, sir. Reach in and get your watch. You, sir, need a new crystal? Say, I got an item for you, Foxini boy. That was the last act you will ever do in this theater. Oh, please, sir. One more essay. I supplicate you. Oh, I shouldn't, but, uh, well, all right. One last essay. 
You close tonight's show, right after the train fields. You won't be lamentating, sir. I promise. Oh, and, and look, Foxini doll, no more of the mystic stuff, huh? It's a family show, you know. Just pull a rabbit out of the hat, will you? But rabbits in those days were hard to find, mainly due to the carrot drought that hit the hinterlands that summer. Ah, but in his meanderings, the fox sauntered down a back alley, and there, eating a picture of a carrot, was a rabbit. Good morrow to you, Finn Rabbit. Hi. Got a picture of some salt on you? No, but I can give you a job. Like doing what? Getting in and out of a hat. Well, sounds easy enough. I'll try it. That evening, the great Foxini climaxed his turn with a new innovation. Yes, folks. This hat does seem to be empty. Aha! But I say the magic words. Roger Pryor and Eileen Pringle and Presto. The crowd gasped, for out of the hat came a rabbit eating a picture of a turkey. Hey, you hear that, Foxini, baby? I'm picking up your option right away. They loved it. You're made. For two weeks, Foxini stopped the show, and then it happened. And presto, out of the hat comes... Nothing. The rabbit did not appear. The curtain came down on the fox, unfortunately. Later in his quarters... But why did you let me down? I'm bored, that's why. You get all the applause while I have to sit all cramped up in that little hat. Tell me what you want. I'll give you anything. Put a false bottom on the hat. That way I can meander around until it's time to do the magic bit. Foxini had no alternative. He acquiesced. But what he didn't know was that while he was on the stage doing his routine, the rabbit was circulating through the audience, picking pockets of all things. You can imagine the fox's dismay when he pulled the rabbit out of the hat and the rabbit had 24 billfolds in his hot little paws. What did you do? Hit the jackpot. Down came the curtain, again on the fox. I can't understand it, Foxini doll. You were coming on like gangbusters. Then all of a sudden, somebody pulled the plug. And that's not all. Some of the customers lost their wallets. Fancy that. Uh, you haven't seen any wallets, have you, doll? Me? Look, rabbit, you want to get us in trouble? You can't steal wallets. But the mind of a distorted rabbit is a cunning mind. This time, when he was plucked from the hat, he came up with an armful of currency stolen from a nearby bank. That wasn't bad enough. Also out of the hat came the squad of police. You're under arrest, Foxini. But, Ossifer, I had nothing to do with this. It was all the rabbit's fault. What rabbit? Sure enough, the wayward hare had chosen that moment to jump back into the hat and escape through the false bottom. But I'm innocent, I tell you. Not only did the fox receive a stiff sentence, but so did the theater manager for contributing to the delinquency of a magician. You know, doll, I just can't believe this is happening. Shut up and break rocks. But we all know that crime doesn't pay. The little rabbit found refuge somewhere in South America, but never got to enjoy the fruits of his ill-gotten gains, for true to his habits, he had eaten a picture of a hard-boiled egg, not realizing that on the other side was a picture of a rotten apple. He took ill and never recovered. And so you see, Junior, a fool and his money are soon parted. I got a better... Oh, dear, hold it, hold it. You were about to say you had a better moral. Well, this time I'm going to beat you to it. You were going to say a fool and his bunny are soon parted, right? Wrong. I was going to say hair today, gone tomorrow. Hair today, uh, dig, Junior. <laughs> when Bullwinkle swallowed a banana containing a formula for a silent explosive called hush -a boom Now, Boris is trying to get it back by hook or by crook. I got a choice. And in our last episode, the boys had received a mysterious invitation to a free weekend at a mountain lodge. Wait a minute. Why would Lake Kitchy Itchy Lodge offer you a free weekend for no reason at all? Who cares? Never look a gift Kitchy Itchy in the mouth, I always say. It was 17 hours later that they arrived at what they thoroughly believed was to be a carefree weekend. No, just a free weekend. Are you sure this is Lake Kitchy Itchy Bullwinkle? Not really, no. There's no lake. There's nothing here but that big old run-down house. we better go back. But at that moment... For he's a jolly good moose. For he's a jolly good moose. For he's a jolly good moose. Which nobody can deny. Welcome to Kitchy Itchy Lodge. Gee, who are you? Who else? I am Egbert Kitchy Itchy himself. <laughs> kind of a funny name, isn't it, Rock? Kitchy Itchy? No, Egbert. If this 
is really a lodge, where are all the other guests? There are no other guests. It's the middle of the slow season, isn't it, Honeybun? Yes, Egbert, darling. When is your slow season? From 1926 to 1982. But look at it this way. I can spend all my time just taking care of you. <laughs> <laughs> thoughty, mighty thoughty. We better be careful, Bullwinkle. I'm afraid he's after you for some reason. Don't be such a worry boy, Rock. Just the same, I'm not going to let you out of my sight. You hear that, Boris? Squirrel is not going to let Moose out of sight. We'll see about that. And he did, too, for after Bullwinkle had freshened up. Well, Moose, you look fresh as Wyatt. How would you like to step out on porch to see the view? Why, I think that would be lovely. Bullwinkle would have stepped out onto the porch, but for one thing, there was no porch. Plunging down two stories, the endangered Moose landed in a carefully prepared tub of cement waiting at the bottom. Now what, Dolly? We fan him until he's dry. And that being a fast-drying cement developed by some gentleman in Chicago in 1928, it wasn't long before... Ah, the a Now to crack him open. Stand back, honeybun. With a well-placed blow from a hammer, the cement split down the middle and fell into two perfect halves. Big deal. So now what you got, Boris? A perfect moose mold. That's what. And putting the cement mold together, Boris poured in a lifelike when dry plastic. When he had finished... Boris, you have made a dummy that looks just like other dummy. Uh, I mean, moose. Right. And that is how we fool Squirrel. You ho, Bullwinkle, where are you? Here comes Squirrel now. Quick, we take moose to basement. Wait for me. Bullwinkle? Bullwinkle, why don't you answer me? <laughs> now, Moose, I got you where I want you. What do you say to that? Why don't you answer me? Why didn't you say something, Bullwinkle? Why does he just stand there like a dummy? Dummy? Darling, you don't suppose. Oh, boy. Please, Moose, don't shut up your mouth. Could it be that I got the dummies mixed up? We'll find out in our next episode entitled, Two Moose is Loose, or Which One Has the Phony? Hang tight. Nickelodeon's moose o will be right back. It's the story of Beauty and the Beast, of Belle's bravery, her love for the Beast, and a race against time. And it's all in a handheld game. You can help Belle find her father, make friends with enchanted objects, and get past Gaston. If you can help Belle kiss the beast before the last rose petal falls, he'll turn back into a prince. And you win. Disney's Beauty and the Beast, an electronic game new from Tiger, batteries not included. You with the two scoops of raisins, pull the boat home over. Unbelievable. Morning, sir. What's this all about? The sweet taste of two scoops of raisins. The big guy would like to have some Kellogg's Raisin Bran with you fine Americans. You're kidding. No, ma'am. We're not allowed. Two scoops of juicy raisins have the taste everyone's sweet on. Kellogg's Raisin Bran, part of this complete breakfast. What if you were lost in New York City? Now you can get your own Home Alone 2 games, free on specially marked boxes of Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Lose a turn! Presenting the one and only fruit-bearing gummy bears. It's a <laughs> Made with the goodness of real fruit juice, they're called amazing fruit. It's a amazing fruit. Amazing fruit. Amazing fruit. Yeah. New amazing fruit is so fruity you can hardly bear it. <laughs> Tropical flavors too. You are in the ozone, and now back to Nickelodeon's Moose Aroma. For those of you who want to soak up some extra knowledge, here's Mr. Know-It-All. Hello, sponge heads. Today's topic is entitled, How to Remove a Unwanted Guest from Your House and Make More Living Room. Supposing you are on your way home from the butcher shop with 14 hot dogs, and you discover there is a 15th hot dog, one with large teeth and a appetite to match. <laughs> it is obvious that the 15th hot dog, whom we shall call Spot, has designs on the 14 hot dogs. Just inches ahead of your pursuer, you arrive home safely. Flushed with victory, you examine your 14 hot dogs, only to find that they are now inside spot. <laughs> Going to the front door, you flang it open wide and point in the general direction of Boys Town, indicating you wish him to leave. 
Finding yourself on the outside with the door bolted, you attempt to gain entrance by way of the chimney. En route, you make a sad discovery. Spot is now brewing himself a spot of tea in the fireplace. <laughs> Fighting fire with fire, we ignite the couch. Soon the fire is completely out of control. The house goes up in smoke. But when the fire has gone out, you discover that Spot has not. Two days later in your rebuilt home, you sit happily in your Morris chair, finally rid of your unwanted guest. But Mr. Nodal, how did you get rid of him? Who? Spot. Oh, quite simple. I used Spot Remover. <laughs> Our story thus far is simplicity itself. What else? Bullwinkle swallowed a secret formula for a silent explosive, and Boris is trying to get it back. Luring Rocky and Bullwinkle to a deserted house, the villain was able to obtain a cement mold of the gullible moose, and thus make a lifelike dummy which looked exactly like Bullwinkle. Bullwinkle, will you stop standing there like a dummy and speak to me? What would you like me to say, Rock? You pulled another boo-boo, Boris. I noticed that, but Boris Bedenov never gives up. Back to the basement. I still think Mr. Kitchy Itchy is up to no good. I'm going to snoop around and see what I can find out. Okay, and I'll step out on the porch for another look at the view. Meanwhile, in the basement... Boris, what are you doing with dummy moose? There now, isn't she pretty? Ah, uh, pretty ugly. Not only that, but I fixed it up so that she walks and talks. Watch this. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Pure genius, darling. Now comes best part. I got bomb inside. When Moose makes date with Dommy... Then it's booby trap. Right, and it's about to trap a booby. <laughs> so Mr. Kitchy Itchy is after Bullwinkle. I gotta get upstairs, but fast. But Rocky wasn't fast enough. Come, Natasha. All we got to do now is find Moose. That was easy because Bullwinkle was just getting up off the ground outside. The view is lovely, but it goes by so fast. Oh, Moose, somebody here I like you to meet. Who's that, Mr. Kitchy Itchy? Bullwinkle, meet Jane Moosefield. <gasps> Jane Moosefield? I will push button, then leave you two to get acquainted. Run, Natasha, bomb goes off any minute. My goodness, the Jane Moosefield. <laughs> I don't know what to say. Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Friendly little thing. <laughs> Leave us go to the kitchen. I shall fix us a bite to eat. My arm, madame. Meanwhile, Rocky had regained his senses and was rushing to find Bullwinkle. Golly, I hope I'm not too late. Would you like me to crumble up some crackers in your soup, Miss Moosefield? Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Hello yourself. How about the crackers? Bullwinkle, that's only a dummy. Who cares if she's smart? Get a load of that figure. You don't understand. I gotta get you away from here. And with that, the plucky squirrel pulled Bullwinkle out of the old house and just in the nick of time. For it was then that Jane Moosefield, ticking loudly, crossed the room to the closet where Boris and Natasha were hiding. Bum should have gone off long time ago. I wonder what... Somebody's at door. <laughs> yes? Hello, handsome. This is a recording. Well, hello! Look, honey bun, it's Jane Moose! Good heavens! What was all that about? I don't know, unless it had something to do with you remembering everything you ever ate. Oh, stuffy nonsense. By the way, what did you eat last? Uh, J-X-Q-T-R-O-P. But Winkle, that doesn't mean anything. Sure it does. It means I ate alphabet soup. But unbeknownst to our heroes, a faraway figure is watching them on a super snooperscope. Pottsylvania must have that formula. We shall use our most ruthless, brutal, cold-blooded scoundrel. You mean... Yes, I go myself. Well, it looks as if our boys have picked up a number one enemy. Tune in next time for The Moose and the Monster, or Nothing But the Pest. <laughs> Would you
we're taking the big orange couch from Beverly Hills over to Nickelodeon's sixth annual Kids' Choice Awards. Roseanne, Luke, Mariah, who are your favorites this year? Stick with us and find out. HBO presents Shakespeare in a way never seen before. Robin Williams hosts a new animated family series Tuesday, November 10th. Shakespeare, the animated tales. I will watch tonight. An exclusive cable creation, premiering Tuesday.